<coughs> well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Bloomfield Candidate Forum. It's nice to see you all here. I'm Scott Micklin. I'm the general manager of KSJE. That's the listener-supported radio station at San Juan College at 90.9 FM. It's my great pleasure to be here. We want to thank our sponsors this evening, the Gateway City Civitan Group and the Bloomfield High School Student Council. Let's give both of those groups a round of applause for putting this together. We do have assistance from the Leadership San Juan Alumni Association as well, and so we thank them. And uh, let me go through some of the ground rules before we get started and hear from all of our uh, candidates. To begin with, I would ask that you check that your telephones, your cellular phones, are cellular phones. How old am I? Cell phones are um, either turned off or on mute or vibrate so they don't interrupt our uh, forum this evening. The speaking order is going to be determined by a drawing of numbers before the forum begins. I'll tell you how that worked out here in just a moment, but that has been done, and so that will be the order that our candidates will be speaking um, this evening. Each candidate tonight will give an introductory statement. They'll have two minutes to do that. We'll keep time, and they will be prompted when time is about to expire. We'll give each of you a 30-second warning, and then a time is up sign, and that'll be done right down here in the front row, and I'll try not to interrupt you unless it sounds like you're really going for it, okay? Um, then there's a two minute time limit for each answer to the questions that I'll be posing and hopefully we'll get some questions from you folks in the audience as well. We'll have folks running around with some uh, index cards and pencils and so if you do have a question, you can get their attention and write down your question and it'll get brought up to me so I can ask that of the candidates. Um, the second part of our forum tonight is going to allow for each candidate to ask one question to one of your opponents. So you'll have that opportunity as well. And as I mentioned, we will take questions from the audience, and then we will have two minutes for closing statements from all of our candidates. So that is kind of the ground rules uh, that everyone has agreed to this evening. So um, let's begin by talking about the drawing of numbers that the candidates did as they entered the auditorium this evening. Um, number one is Ken Hare. He'll be speaking first this evening. Sue Finch is number two. Cecilia Gunnell, number three. Cynthia Atencio, number four. Benny Kling, number five. DeLaws Lindsay, number six. Richard Kemp, number seven. Elwin Rourke, number eight. And Scott Eckstein, number nine. That is the order of the candidates that will be speaking this evening. And we will kind of shift those as we go, but that'll be how we'll start. So to begin with, um, let's give all of these fine folks a round of applause for stepping up to run for political office this year. Of course, we have our mayor candidates and our city council candidates, and uh, we'll be hearing from all of them this evening. But let's start with our opening statements for two minutes, and uh, we'll start with that. And to start, it'll be um, Mr. Hare. You have two minutes, please. Yes, please use the microphone. Um, I have a very long history here. My great-grandfather great came to Bloomfield in the 1890s. Our farm in, in the middle of Bloomfield will be 100, is 100 years old this year. So uh, very, uh, you know, I have a strong legacy based on, on my uh, familial pioneers that have come into this area. Uh, we're also very, very heavily invested in Bloomfield. My, my concern, uh, as I've been very involved in economic development over the, over the last eight years in San Juan County, uh, about a year ago, <clears throat> things really changed here in the county. Today, we have no major oil and gas companies left in San Juan County. Within the past year, and especially the last six months, they've all left. They've been bought out by smaller companies. In addition, with the coal mines and the power plants scheduled to close down, it's of huge concern to me for the growth of, uh, of Bloomfield. A recent study that came out a couple of weeks ago from the Kellogg Foundation through a, through a group called Innovate Educate estimates that over the next 10 years, the uh, county will lose an additional 7,000 plus uh, jobs. And this is in addition to the 5,000 plus jobs that we've already lost to this point. So uh, we have great economic challenges uh, facing Bloomfield, and I just felt that I bring new skill sets to the table. 
uh, new experiences. We've got challenging times ahead of us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, we'll hear from Sue Finch, please. Um, first, I'd like to again thank the Gateway Civity Civitan and the Bloomfield High School Student Council for hosting this forum. Um, my name is Sue Ann Finch, and I've lived in Bloomfield for the last 44 years. Uh, I'm married to John Finch, and he's the person that's been, was born and raised here in Bloomfield. Uh, we have five children that have attended the Bloomfield schools. Uh, we have had businesses here. We have uh, rental properties here also. Um, I was also blessed to be able to teach preschool uh, age children for 27 years. I have worked within our neighborhood association to bring the North Frontier subdivision together and encourage the North neighborhood, the neighborhood watch program, which I think is very important with the crime that's coming off in the city of Bloomfield. Uh, my strengths is I bring to the council in integrity, leadership, organization, organizational skills, and common sense. And I love the city of Bloomfield. And I love the citizens that are here. I think we're a tight-knit group, and we truly want our, our city to be a good, safe, productive community. Uh, I'm watching her real closely, so I won't go over my time. <laughs> Um, I was given some wonderful advice when I first signed up for this candidacy, and someone told me to go and interview all the department heads. And my questions to those department heads were, I have 30 seconds, so I've got to talk quick. Um, what could I do as a council member to help you listen, to bring the council together, to bring those concerns to the council? And I want you to know real quick that it was an eye-opener for me. I realized that I knew very little about what was happening with the city of Bloomfield, but within that knowledge, I know that I can take those skills that I have as a citizen and work to strengthen Bloomfield. Thank you. Thank you very much. Cecilia Gunnell, we'll hear from you next, please. or talked in a microphone before, so that's kind of weird. But um, So good evening, and thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm Cecilia Ganell. I currently am a level two coordinator in the oil and gas industry. And I have two children that I'm raising. That'll be our fifth generation of our family to reside in Bloomfield. I am running for city council to increase my level of service to my community with for those who have no time, no money, or maybe lack the initiative to stand up and and um, know how to change things. Um, I intend to do this through the process improvement. I feel like we really could change a lot of the things that we do now um, to better our situation for the future. Um, I also think we should implement a lot more programs and services and most importantly, more transparent communication. Because a lot of the people I visited with um, had no clue the issues that our city was having. Doors I knocked on of teachers that have taught in Bloomfield for seven, eight, nine years, they had no clue about the water system. They had no clue about this or that. Um, it could be lip service, uh, it could be true. So uh, we, we need to repair some of that kind of issue. Thank you very much. Next, we will hear from the first uh, mayoral candidate on our list uh, this evening, and that is Cynthia Atencio. Okay, so I'm Th Cynthia Atencio, and I've been in Bloomfield for 36 years, and I'm a, I'm a proud 1988 graduate of Bloomfield High School. Go Bobcats. Thank you, City Council. And then <laughs> I worked for the City of Bloomfield for 18 years. In my 18 years there, I worked for both the police department and for the court system. While I was at the police department, I was the grant administrator as well, <coughs> so I have some experience with grant funding mostly in law enforcement, but I do have that. I've been a Chamber of Commerce board member for the last probably 12 years. I was previously a Boys and Girls Club board member as well. And what I want, my goal is to be a voice for our community. I want, I've gotten, if anything, I've gotten the best experience here to go out and talk to our citizens, our business owners, and I love that. I love that and I, I want to continue to do that and hear not just, not just the citizens and the business owners but also the employees, but to bring their thoughts and their ideas back to the council and to the mayor 
and to work as a voice for them. I am not a career politician and I don't strive to be one. I want to be able, if elected, I'd like to come in and do what I can to do the best I can and then move on and hand the torch to somebody else. Um, that my, some of my goals are to work with the council, department heads, if elected, to grow our economy. I know it's, we're in a bust time right now, but to work together to find those kind of solutions and to employ and retain the best employees that we can for the city of Bloomfield. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, it is um, the other, one of the other candidates for mayor, Benny Kling. Hear from you, please. Thank you. Um, I have some serious concerns. If I wasn't concerned about City Hall, I'd be sitting at home watching reruns of Gunsmoke. Uh, the city's faced with some very serious problems, and I mean serious. We have a meth problem that's getting out of hand. We have problems with the fire department being underfunded. Uh, on the evening of July 4th, a young high school kid, uh, one of the cadets, was pinned between two fire trucks right in front of my house. So we've got to do something to bring in monies for full-time firefighters, and it affects our insurance, both at home and at businesses. Uh, some of the things that were already brought up, the wastewater treatment plant has one leg in the grave. If we don't make improvements to it immediately, our growth will mean nothing, because the more we grow, the worse that plant gets. It cannot handle too much more. I've only lived in Bloomfield 12 years, but I have a vested interest in it as a citizen also, and as a senior citizen. The one thing that concerns me most is we absolutely have to stop the lawsuits. Now, we can't afford to go out and pay the kind of money we have been. We have no business buying another utility and those employees, and we can't afford the ones we got. We've got to take care of them first. We have better luck generating electricity here. That's about all I have right now. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Next on our list, uh, Council Candidate DeLaws Lindsay, please. Uh, thank you for coming out tonight. I appreciate you guys. And uh, anyway, I moved to Bloomfield in 1987. Uh, I came here as a, a racehorse jockey, and uh, <clears throat> I kept trying to move away, and I just kept coming back and coming back, and, and finally I decided it was because of you guys. It was because of the citizens that live here, the people. They were friendly. They, they were just my type of people. I really enjoy living here. And so anyway, I, I bought a little place just outside of the city limits. And, uh, and then about five years after I'd purchased it, they, they annexed me into the city. And I was kind of upset about it at first. And then I got to where I was okay with it. And then I decided, well, now that they've annexed me in, I'm going to go and run for office and have a voice in, in what... Uh, what takes place in the city. And so um, I've really enjoyed the last four years that uh, I've been on the council. Um, I didn't have a clue. I still am just starting to even get a glimpse of, of uh, what it takes to run a city. You know, I, I just, all I, all I ever wanted to do is gripe when my road was bad. But now I understand that it takes a lot more than even just money to do those things. And so um, uh, I really appreciate the way that the city is going. I think that we've been through some real tough times the last couple of years, but I know that we're coming out of it. So I just want to be a part of that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next up, it's uh, Richard Kemp. Is on. Uh, yeah, my name is Richard Kipp. I'm running for uh, city council also, and uh, I'm not a career, career politician either. Uh, but uh, 
I just like to see things change around here. I see a lot of things that's going wrong, and uh, like a lot of candidates have said, you know, like the crime uh, uh, is real bad. Uh, I've uh, worked uh, 15 years for the city of Farmington in the line department, so I understand about the electric. So, but uh, and I've lived here for 20 years in Bloomfield itself, so. Uh, I understand all this, uh, and like a lot of people have said, you know, there's a lot of there's been a, a lot of wasted money I think spent on th some things that we don't need around here in Bloomfield. You know, uh, we need to, for instance, the water. We need water. If we don't have water, then we ain't got no Bloomfield. So uh, we do need to focus on that. I think that should be number one priority right now. Uh, and. Uh, I'm glad to see uh, so many women trying to, trying to get involved too. I think that they should be, shouldn't be just a one-sided affair, so. Uh, anyway, that's my feeling, so. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ellen Rourke, please. <clears throat> Thank you for calling me Ellen. Uh, my full name is James Ellen O'Rourke, and, and with recent uh, changes in, in the uh, group, government rules and regulations, most forms, you know, we want your first name, middle initial, and last name, that's it. So, but I've gone by Ellen my whole life. If you call me James, I may not answer because I don't recognize it. But with that said, you know, I, my wife and I moved here in uh, June of uh, 1970. We've been here ever since. I like to tell people, you know, you can get on top of B Hill over here and you can see everywhere I've been my whole life, but that's not true. I've been around the world about three times and in doing so, that was the primary thing that I did was building refineries, uh, start them up and train the uh, uh, operators how to run them. And then I'd go on and do the next one. And that's what I was doing. I, I think one of the scariest times was uh, in, uh, when I was in Siberia, uh, for whatever reason, they uh, uh, took my passport and I was stuck there for about six months. And I finally got home. When I got into Los Angeles, I kissed the ground, called my office, told them I wasn't going back. <clears throat> but I understand, I worked in the oil field long enough to understand these boom and bust cycles that the oil field goes through. Um, and until the market increases, uh, we're not going to see an increase in the uh, oil fail. And we're going to have to deal with the shortage of the money um, the best that we can. Uh, and we're going to have to make the cutbacks necessary to uh, uh, meet the expenses to the uh, income that we have. Um, and I appreciate the uh, uh, input that everybody has. Uh, I hope that everybody would uh, put some input in and because uh, that's how we know what your uh, uh, worries are and what, what concerns you the most. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we'll hear from our other candidate for mayor, Scott Eckstein. Hello, everybody. I'm uh, Scott Eckstein. I've been your mayor for the past 12 years. Prior to that, I was on the Bloomfield City Council. I've also served eight years as a county commissioner. I've got my wife here. She supported me through all this. She supported me through 20 years of law enforcement. I'm a retired police officer. Also have my son who's a volunteer firefighter for Bloomfield Fire Department. And my parents are also here tonight to listen and possibly show support if I convince them. Um, when I first ran for council, I made four goals. The first goal was to work on city beautification. We have medians beautiful medians running through town. We took the opportunity to take something the state was gonna stamp with just red concrete and beautify that, hopefully slow traffic down so that they would stay and shop in Bloomfield. Another goal I set 14 years ago was to work on economic development. Through a private public partnership that many people criticized at the time when I first became mayor, we brought in a industrial park, 80 acre industrial park that now has Wagner Cat is the first tenant. Most of the other property is sold. This is privately owned, but the city worked with these people. And uh, Wagner Cat is huge for Bloomfield. And we've also annexed the gas plants, which 
really have the potential to help Bloomfield out. So I think we're being proactive, but we've got a lot of work to do on that also. The other goal that I set was to be prudent with your tax dollars. I can tell you right here, right now, that in the 14 years I've been elected, we as a governing body have not raised your taxes one time. Your taxes have been raised twice, but that was through a vote of the citizens. I insisted that it go to the public for a vote. The council agreed and the citizens voted on it, not us, the council. And lastly, I made a goal to keep the citizens informed on how their money is spent. To that end, we have the bits and pieces, which I created, that goes out in the water bill monthly. And we have a very active social media page. We have a brand new City of Bloomfield website. And we continue to work on ways to reach out to you as the community. My time's up. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much. Thank you, everybody. Go ahead. Give them a round of applause. I want to reassure the candidates and the audience, there is no trap door up here. If you do happen to go over time, you can finish your thought before um, I call you on time. So nothing bad will happen if you go a little bit over two minutes. But, but thank you, everybody, for paying so close attention to the clock. That's really important. So now we'll start asking some questions. And again, I'll remind the audience, if you have a question that you'd like to ask the candidates, um, there are volunteers that have cards and pencils wandering around and uh, let them know that you have a question and jot it down and it will find its way um, up to me throughout the forum this evening. So we definitely want you to participate as well. But in the meantime, I've got a couple of questions I would like to ask um, all of the candidates. I think um, it's an important topic for if you're sitting, serving on the city council or you're serving as mayor. So everybody will get a chance to answer. We will shift um, the answering by uh, one. And so um, let's see. I would like to start, I guess, Mr. Eckstein, you will start because you were last last time. So Perfect. we'll start with you and then we'll go to Mr. Hare and so forth down the line again in, in the order that you drew. So the question is about the electric utility and the lawsuit with the city of Farmington. And there's certainly full disclosure, I live in the city of Farmington, but I certainly don't work for the city. Right. Um, but that's been going on now. It continues to, to kind of drag on through the courts. I guess my question is quite simply, um, are you in favor of continuing and seeing this through or trying to find a way to, to end this litigation? There's, there's a question. Well, I hope I can answer that question in two minutes, Scott. I'll, I'll okay, do my best. I know. First of all, the biggest misunderstanding that the public has right now is that if and when we win the lawsuit, which we've already won, but Farmington has appealed it, that we'll automatically over, take over the electric utility. That's not the case. That just means we have the right to acquire the utility. I go door to door, I hear people say, we can't afford it right now. We don't have to afford it right now. It may be five years, it may be 10 years, it may be the time when we can afford it. What we want to establish is that we have the right to acquire the utility. Myself and the former city manager, David Fuquay, met with Rob Mays, Farmington's city manager, and their uh, uh, mayor, uh, Tommy Roberts, before we even started this. They acknowledged the fact that we had the right to acquire that utility. Then when they found out that we were serious about it, apparently they talked to some legal firm or something and they said, you have a right to acquire what was here in 1959. That's two poles. If you want them, you can buy them. Well, that's not, that's not the case. And we, we were forced to sue them because they refused to sit down and talk to us again. So we were forced to sue them. Judge Daly found in our favor they have appealed that. So this process is being drug on by the city of Farmington. We have legal fees invested in this at this point and we need to carry it through and establish that right. If, if, we, if and when we win the lawsuit, and I'm certain we will, we have once and we will again, this is probably going to happen long after any of us up here or are even on the council. Um, certainly, this is my last run at mayor. Certainly, it will most likely happen after I'm gone, if it happens. But I think we have a right to, to acquire that utility. When we've done our research, we say Farmington makes millions of dollars a year off the city of Bloomfield. Well, once we take out what they pay for their employees, what they pay for their gas, and what they pay for equipment and everything else, they're making $600,000 a year off of you, the citizens of Bloomfield. That is a tenth of our budget that we could be putting back, paying for the electric utility system, and eventually paying for parks and things like sending out nasty letters like they sent out to you that were full of half-truths and lies. Uh, with your money. So that's my feeling on it. All right. Thank you very much. Ken here. We're going to go to you. Same question. And that is basically on the electric utility lawsuit with the city of Farmington. And please use the microphone. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, back in June of 2015, the city hired uh, the Star Group to facilitate a discussion uh, among citizens to study the electrical issue. 
and we it was a good committee there were about 20 uh, good good citizens and after about four meetings uh, it got very very complex this is an extremely complex issue uh, these the facilitator called me and said would you be able to get a group of four or five people who have the technical expertise to evaluate the feasibility study and and I did I got uh, uh, I got Roy Carter I got Doug Mize I got Merle Dennis and I got Jan Evans who was running the refinery um, anyway we we spent a lot of time and we went through the feasibility study we were able to secure additional information that wasn't in the feasibility study and on 2010 we raised these concerns the we felt the expenses were very understated uh, some were not mentioned nor defined revenue was overstated the the we had concerns about the cost of power uh, the cost of the debt uh, we had some load issues. We had cost of the system was undefined. It still is. We, had, we did feel that there was a conflict of interest in, in the study itself. Uh, it would take a lot of money. Would we be able to borrow the money? Uh, we had concerns over the legal fee. We reached out to someone in a difference in the state of Texas who'd, who had retired with a large uh, utility and he simply said look we got the same rule in Texas and when these small communities come to us we grind them out in court and uh, and, and clearly we're in that position now uh, the model can become very uh, obsolete very quickly uh, future issues uh, we have we had concerns about future revenue issues my my proposal this is Your time too, is almost up mr. Harris. this is too big for a few people to decide. We have got to move forward with the town council type format and bring in some third parties, get all the questions on the floor and, and make a decision. Thank you. Thank you very much. It is a complicated issue, I understand. Sue Finch is next. Same question, please, if you will. Your thoughts on the electric utility issue, can please. Can I say ditto? No. <laughs> you can. You have about a minute 55 left. <laughs> okay, thank you. <clears throat> no, um, I agree with Ken completely, and I have studied both the Farmington and our reasonability study, and within that guidelines that I've studied it, I feel that Bloomfield, because I've also studied the budget, there is, it's not logical, it doesn't have common sense to pursue this. Thank you very much. Cecilia Gunnell, you are next, please. Okay, I too have talked to people both in the city of Bloomfield and the city of Farmington, and I agree. It's, it would have been a great idea five or ten years ago as a proactive measure to secure funds for our people in the city of Bloomfield. But now we're in a reactive time frame. Um, I don't think even five, ten, fifteen years down the line, it'll be something that our town can sustain. I mean, we have ballparks that aren't even functioning because we don't have enough groundskeepers or, you know, parks department people. But do you want to come up with, I mean, enough staff to run utility in, in Bloomfield? I mean, I can't, I can't drive my street with potholes, the pool's not functioning. It's just not feasible right now. And that's where I stand. Thank you very much. Cynthia Atencio, our mayoral candidate. Okay, and I'll address this not so much to, I mean, I had my own opinion, but what I wanted to do as, an elect, as a candidate was go out and talk to the people. So that's what I did. I talked to citizens, I talked to business owners, and I'm still going out to talk to citizens and business owners. And they pretty much stand, and I've got a chance to talk to Ken because he was on the first committee, and I talked to Doug Mize. And I don't claim to have an engineering degree, but I can tell you Doug Mize does, you know, and I know these people, they're from our community, they care about our community, and I have not met one person that is in favor of it. I've met one person that thinks maybe it's a good idea, and it's hard, it's hard. I mean, I understand wanting to get the ability to do it, and I don't know about going forward with it, because when you take these money to pay these lawyer fees, but you cut the employee's pay, 
and we haven't given them that payback. And then, like she said, we, you know, some of the employees we lost, we even lost one to, um, to a death and we didn't replace them. So you have some employees here that are doing two jobs, maybe even more. I don't know how I can look my friends and my neighbors and my family in the face and tell them, you don't deserve your payback, but we're gonna do this and we wanna bring on new employees. Linemen aren't cheap. If you want good linemen, you want the right bucket trucks, I don't know all the numbers, but I know we don't have the money, and I know Scott said that's not something we need to do now. And I understand, like I said, about trying to get the right to do it, but I don't know that this is the right time for that either when you're putting all that money into legal fees. Thank you. Thank you very much. Penny Kling, you are next, please. I totally agree. Oops. I totally agree with Cynthia. I, I visited with David Fugue when this was just a concept in his mind. And I told him he was an idiot. <laughs> I've been through these acquisitions with power companies before. I was a chief of police in Nebraska, outside of Lincoln. And the community decided they were going to have their own electric utility. And that was without lawsuits. That was something that they negotiated with the Omaha Public Power District. And I can tell you, they so drastically underestimated and underbudgeted what that cost was, and it took them 11 years just to get on their feet. When they got done, the revenue was nothing, virtually nothing. We spent a great deal of money on lawsuits, and we can't afford it any longer. We need to cut our losses, accept what we are, do what we can, and try to bring businesses in. My idea is Bloomfield is setting in an ideal position to generate power. We should be negotiating with Farmington Electric Utility to work to re-establish the electricity we're going to lose when they close the power plants. We can do that here with one big generator on the hill and a big solar farm. And that's something we can go in together with and budget out over a longer period of time. That'll help keep our utility rates down and supply good clean power thank you thank you very much Tilaz Lindsay please uh, yes I you know I think it's important that we keep uh, uh, number one I think that the people in Bloomfield have been uh, lied to and, and really uh, they just haven't been told the truth from from Farmington from that that letter I read it several times just and, and I just could not believe what Rob Mays was saying uh, bottom line we are trying to establish establish the right so that 5 10 15 years down the road that we can do that if we don't do it now we're not ever going to be able to break away Aztec did it they did it through a lawsuit, but now they're successful at what they do. Uh, uh, the Apache Hickory Apache tribe has done it. They're successful, already up and running, and doing a good job at what they're doing. So it can be done. And, and I just, I would like to see that money and them resources come back and stay in Bloomfield. So thank you. Thank you very much. Richard Kemp, please. Uh, same question, I guess. Uh, Sa yes, same question. Yeah, I'm uh, totally against it myself. Uh, I've been in towns like uh, I lived for 13 years and worked for Hamas Mountain Electric Co-op, and they wanted to take over too. And uh, we fought them, and uh, we won the case because uh, it was totally crazy for them to even think that they could build a powerhouse and generate their own electricity when they're buying it from Plains Electric. So uh, there's no way at this time, you know, that, that there's, we've got too many other things on the pot right now and we need to take care of our water for one thing. That ain't gonna cost, uh, you know, that's gonna cost a lot. Way up in the millions. I don't know where the money's gonna come from for that, so. But I agree with this other gentleman over here about the, the solar, that's a good idea, you know. That's, uh, we, should, we should be looking 
for ways to get together with the other communities around here and uh, work together on some of this. And uh, that's what I'll get to say on that. All right. Thank you very much. Mr. Rourke, same question, please. Your thoughts on this electric utility issue? Well, I, personally, I think it's a, it's a good idea to look at it. Now, as Mayor Eckstein already stated, you know, <clears throat> what we're trying to do is uh, get Parmington to sit down with this and we can go over all this. Uh, I think all of us agree that um, until we can get look at all the nuts and bolts inside this thing, we're not going to make a decision to follow through with any kind of a purchase. We want to know everything. As far as the generation of electricity, we've already spoken with uh, uh, Williams uh, out there. They've got a cogeneration plant that they will sell to us, and the cogeneration is one of the most efficient ways to generate electricity. The next efficient way uh, of uh, generating electricity is through the uh, dams and the uh, turbines there, uh, which Farmington has that. And under federal law, and a WAP of power, it has to be divided, and we'll have an equal opportunity as a generator to purchase that power. And that, that is the cheapest electricity available on the market and the cleanest. Now, <clears throat> that is all uh, uh, good and acceptable, but, uh, but uh, I think we have to look at all the nuts and bolts and everything before we make a decision. Uh, and I think primarily uh, we agree that two, once we have all that information, we'll put it out to the public and you will be asked to vote on it. Uh, it's not just gonna be our decision. Uh, it, it, it's gonna be just like the tax increase. We put it out to vote, you voted for the tax increase. But I have one question for you. Namely, one society that has ever tacked and spent itself into prosperity. We're trying to look for some second source income, and I'll bet you that the majority of you at some time have yourselves or known some member of your family that has went out and looked for a second job to increase income into their family. And that's what we're trying to do, is look for a second source of income for the city of Bloomfield. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Next question, everyone. And uh, Mr. Rourke, we're going to start with you. So don't relax just yet. Uh, this is from the audience. So thank you, audience, for the questions. With first responders in Bloomfield consistently being underpaid as compared to all other first responders in the county, what are your plans to make us competitive with other agencies in the county to reduce turnover and costs associated with turnover? Mr. Rourke. <coughs> Well, the thing, biggest thing about uh, uh, the uh, uh, pay, uh, the layoffs in the city of Bloomfield has been the bus cycle with the oil field. And until we can get some more income, we're going to have to stay right where we're at because we don't have the money to spend. You cannot spend uh, $100 if you only got $20 in the bank account. It's just that simple. And... Uh, we would love to give the people raises. We'd love to get more uh, uh, equitable with uh, pays uh, with other places because we have lost employees to other places for that purpose of going for higher wages. And we need to be able to commit. And that goes right along with the need for extra income so we can meet those needs. Uh, until we get more money in the bank account, we can't write the check. It's just that simple. And that's what we're looking for with this electrical generation to put more money in the bank so we can write those bigger checks and keep more people around. Thank you very much. Scott Eckstein, same question for you on pay for first responders. You know, I, I have conversations with Chief Foster um, about that and being a retired law enforcement officer, I understand. I, I left Bloomfield Police Department after seven and a half years with them looking for greener pastures and I went to the sheriff's office and I wish I'd have never done that. I wish I'd have finished my career in Bloomfield. Uh, but <clears throat> what, what keeps the officers here, yes, we had to cut pay and I think every one of us on the council wants to raise that pay. That's a top priority for us when we got the funding to do it. Um, but what I think keeps officers here is respect for the uh, 
for the administration and respect for the chief, respect for what they have, um, and, and knowing that they're appreciated. When we, when we did that pay cut, I, I expected kind of a mass exodus, and we didn't lose a lot of employees because I think they understood that that's something we had to do. We had to, we had to balance a budget, and it was extremely tough. I know every one of us on the council were sick to our stomach over the decisions we had to make. We listened to the public. We did the best we could, but ultimately we balanced the budget. Uh, we do want to get that payback up. But in order to do that, we've got to do what Mr. Hare was saying. We've got to get out there and we've got to diversify our economy. We've got to get some income. Bloomfield was hit the worst out of all the three communities over this bust in the oil and gas industry. Makes me proud that we got so much oil and gas here, but we lost in a one year period 34% of our income due to the decline in the oil and gas industry, while Farmington lost 17 because they have more retail than us, and Aztec lost 12. That's through no fault of the city of Bloomfield. We can't force businesses to come here, and we can't force them out. The best we can do is work with the ones we have. Like I said, I love the oil and gas. I'll do anything I can to keep them here and to do anything I can to fight regulations um, to keep them here. But we do need to diversify our economy. And that was the purpose of the industrial park. And we're still working on getting more diverse industry within our city. Thank you very much. Ken Hare, question comes to you. First responders' salaries. So having served on the uh, Sandman College Board for 11 years, we, we dealt with these type of issues all the time. And, and what you have to do, you have to focus like a laser uh, on your core mission. And from there, everything else goes out uh, as a priority. In this particular case, to address the EMS, uh, these are priority issues, and in in my mind, you you address your debt service, and then you you know your water and electricity. But the problem that we have in this area with both police and EMS is other cities are paying more, and I I think that leadership in very difficult financial times uh, has to be making tough decisions. Uh, based on that on data that that is very complete and if we are indeed losing our security and and our fire and EMS then we have to sit down and make a tough decision and and maybe we're going to have to increase those even though it's not fair to all of the others I mean it's a matter of establishing your priorities and, and those require tough decisions. Uh, I would say I, I'm, I'm, I'm very, you know, I, I, it's very difficult to me to c c keep spending legal fees uh, when we're losing good employees. Thank you very much. Sue Finch, next please. Thank you. Um, in my interviews with the city top officials and visiting with them, the morale down is enormous across the board. You know, they're like uh, Cynthia said, they're doing two to three, some even four. They're cleaning their offices. They're uh, cleaning the public restrooms. I mean, it's just an ongoing thing. If we don't come up with some kind of economic development and working with avenues that are within there, in that economical development in San Juan County, we won't be able to come up with the monies because we've spent so much out on lawyer fees. I truly believe that if we are to succeed, we need to address that issue, address the issue of no more lawsuits, and try to use common sense as we make decisions as a council. Thank you. Thank you very much. Cecilia Gunnell, please. Same question. My answer will be short because I, I mirror both, both people um, to my right. I spoke to several um, police officers, uh, a few fire uh, department people, and I did not get, I did not get that they were in respect for. Um, the officials and that that's why they were staying. That, those weren't the answers I received. It may be because I'm not their boss. Um, but they were unhappy. They stayed because they have to. 
you have mortgages. We all have mortgages. Um, so I think we're going to have to buckle down just like everybody else and, and stop with the, the bad decisions, the legal fees, all those things, because you have, to, you have to pay your people and keep your people happy because low morale is like a cancer and it's just gonna spread and pretty soon you have nothing left. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, mayoral candidate, Cynthia Atencio, please. Okay, where to start with this one? <laughs> okay, all of you, know, most of you that know here, I worked in the police department most of the time I was there, so the police department always has my heart. I love John Moeller, love our fire department. This has been a constant issue always with Bloomfield. Um, and, and I don't ever wanna say, cause you know, I know even Scott, like as a young officer, you gotta do what's best for your family. So we can't ever fault those employees for going there. But I kind of did a little bit of research too and talking to different people and stuff, and it would cost about $139,000 to give back the, just the raise part, the, not the raise, the cut, to give the cut back to the employees. I don't know how much it would cost to give back what they had to increase the 5% in insurance that they had to do, but if you look at that $139,000 and look at what we spent in legal fees, that, and you know, and that's just to give that three point whatever percent back to the employees that we currently have. That's not even it replacing the employees that we haven't filled their spots. You know, I, I always think, like I said, you know, emergency services has my heart, but without water and wastewater, we don't even have a city. So that has to be our main priority right there, our water source and cleaning that water. That's our main priority. And then emergency services. Like I said, police department will always have my heart. And I, you know, I live here. I want us to have the best employees, not just the best officers, the best employees. And we do have some of the best employees. Some of these people are still my friends. I want them paid back. I want to retain them. I don't think we can afford to lose these hardworking people that are working two, three, four jobs. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Mr. Kling, your answer, please, to this question. Well, I've spoken to uh, a few of the officers. The one thing I can tell you, considering a 3% pay cut and a 6%, about a 6% loss in wage, or benefits, that's a 9% loss in wages and benefits, that's a big cut. And I will hand it to uh, Randy Foster and uh, our fire department uh, for the people they have and keeping the morale as high as it really is. Uh, most of the other employees in the city I don't have much contact with, but these lawsuits have cost us. And I think we've had 50 years to buy electric utility. We should have done something many, many years ago if we needed it or wanted it. To start now in the condition we're in, I don't care if we have the right to own an electric utility or not. I think it's a waste. We're never going to gain the money back. Having the right, it just says, hey, we did it, Farmington. We need to take care of these employees. Uh, first responders, like I said, that boy was pinned between two fire trucks. And if we'd had, probably had full-time firemen working with those people on the 4th of July, rather than all being mostly volunteers, uh, I don't think it would have happened. They needed that extra supervision. We're taxing uh, our volunteer fire department to the extent that it's getting hard to even find somebody. I spent 30 years in law enforcement, and I've been on several fire departments. Uh, we got to start looking at our people. We can save that additional expense for attorney fees because it's going to be a lot more of them and use that money to pay our employees. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Delaz Lindsay, please. Same question to you on first responders. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, right up front, I want to just say thank you to our police and our fire department for all that they do. Not only them, but every city worker. Uh, you know, we've got people that are working two and three departments uh, spread out throughout the city. They are double tasking, they are triple tasking, and I just thank them for what they're doing. Um, 
but as far as you know, and, and I'm, I would never downgrade your, your full-time firefighters or anything like that, but what about our volunteers? They're every bit as trained, they're, they're there, they're trained, and I appreciate, you know, uh, bottom line, Aztec, I think, runs their whole department on volunteer. Um, I, I really appreciate the, the ones that have stepped up just even in the last year here to help out. Uh, I say thank you so much. And, and so in that, you know, I just think that uh, uh, as we continue to, uh, to uh, uh, increase our, our economy and, and uh, try to invite new, new companies and, and new uh, businesses into this, we've got some resources here. Uh, I, I believe that we can, we can begin to look at uh, um, our, our recreation. We've got one of the most outstanding places for recreation. Uh, you know, there's, there's lots of businesses that could, that could crop up throughout, through that. So thank you. Thank you very much. And Richard Kemp. Richard Kemp. Yep. Yeah. We haven't heard from you yet, so we want to hear from you. We want to hear from you. Okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, I agree on that. I thank the, the fire department and what's left of the police department, and uh, I think that's great, you know. But, uh, you know, if, if you, they can't, can't pay them a good, decent uh, wage, well, yeah, they ain't going to be around here. You know, people can go where they can make money, and they just don't come out and volunteer to work for free. So... Um, and, the, and I don't understand why we have uh, these people doing double duty. Um, maybe we need to look at some other ways to cut, maybe at the top. Cut some of these wages, you know. Get it back down to where the rest of the folks can have a piece of the pie, too. So, uh, I don't know. Uh, that's one thing to look at. But uh, I think we need to cut our loss on this powerhouse and uh, power plant and taking over the city. and. Because the lawyers just keep on making money, and nobody makes money, you know, when you deal with lawyers. So uh, that's about all I got. Thanks. All right. Thank you very much. And Mr. Kemp, I'm going to start with you for this next question. Okay. Go ahead. You're going to go first. So here it is from the audience. Everyone is talking about economic development, but what specific plans do you have for economic development in Bloomfield? That's a tough one because the first thing we have to do is work on our water. So we need, if we have water, then we can bring, we can start looking at businesses to come in here. Uh, you know, we need uh, competition for the ones that are here. Uh, little competition never hurt anybody, I don't think. Uh, maybe another grocery store. Uh, uh, we need a truck stop, you know. I think a truck stop would be excellent, you know. Uh, they bring in a lot of revenue. Uh, Truckers need some place to sleep. We've got plenty of motels around here. They could stay in them, you know. Uh, like our curbside pickup, you know, uh, on recyclables. We could do that uh, for things to re revenue a little bit of money here and there. Uh, there's a lot of plans that uh, we could come up with. But, uh, again, I think we need to drop some of these lawsuits and Let's just get on with living, so thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Rourke, you're up next to answer this question on economic development. Well, <clears throat> I don't, we, it's impossible to make any, uh, force anybody to move their business here. Uh, we've got to concentrate on what there is already here. And one thing is that we have done is, is beautify the city. It, 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 with the uh, Highway 64 uh, landscaping. Um, I, it, we did that in hopes of uh, people driving through would uh, be impressed with what that is and uh, look forward to coming and visiting, staying in motels, using those motels to, as a center to drive from. We've got a lot of uh, ruins around here, Chaco ruins, ruins over in Aztec, salmon ruins, uh, cliff dwellings up in uh, uh, Colorado. Uh, we would like to see those people stay and 
get the revenue off the hotels, off of uh, the restaurants, uh, and see if we can't concentrate on that. Uh, and I, just my personal opinion, too, I think that the uh, uh, Highway 64 uh, um, landscape looks one heck of a lot better than two brand new rusty buildings. Uh, and I would certainly like to do something with them. And in, in answering to the uh, uh, concern about cutting at the top, I'm not sure who you mean, uh, because uh, if you want to cut at the top, you're talking about cutting Chief Moeller, you're talking about cutting uh, uh, Chief Foster, because uh, I dang sure can tell you that uh, sitting on the city council and being the mayor is not the top paying jobs here. Uh, <laughs> so if you're gonna cut the money, uh, we're going to have to cut those guys, and I think that's the wrong place to cut. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Scott Eckstein, you're next, please. Same question. Economic development, please. Uh, I'd just kind of like to tag on to what Council Rourke said. The city of Bloomfield had an opportunity about five years ago to raise the council's and the mayor's pay. I currently make 7500 a year. The council makes 5000 Aztec makes about double. Farmington does make double. We had the opportunity, and I specifically remember Councillor Rourke saying, if there's any extra money in the budget, please give it to the employees. So that's, I, I don't want people to think we're serving to serve ourselves. We're serving to serve the people. Uh, about economic development, there are things that, uh, that are currently in, in, in the works. Um, working with uh, Tim Cummins, the owner of the uh, industrial park, We've got a lot of potential there. We've got such a good working relationship with him. I consider the man a friend, and when that industrial park fills, he's got plans to maybe even add on more uh, property to it, and that comes with a good, strong working relationship. We were working with REM, another company that was planning on building a retail center down by the river, and we were really going a lot of work on that. We have a plan conceptual drawn up if you want to come to City Hall and look at it. It's, it's great, but the economy dropped out in 2004 with the, with the drop of the price of oil from OPEC and all the investors pulled out. But we continue to still have a good relationship with them in case the economy picks up, which we're working on. Uh, we can pick up our plan where we, where we had it. Just last week, I had a property owner in Bloomfield that wants to bring in a retail chain uh, restaurant, I can't say the name of it, but he was having issues with the state. He'd been working with the state for eight years to try to get those issues re resolved. It came to me and Eric Straw, our city manager. I called Senator Steve Neville, who happens to be a friend. So I'm, what I'm talking about is relationships and building those relationships. And while he's in session, he's going to do what he can. He thinks he can get this problem resolved and we can get this chain fast food restaurant into Bloomfield. So it's things like that. Uh, it's building those relationships and continuing with those relationships and making our economy grow. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ken Hare, we're going to come to you next for the answer to that question on economic development, please. So economic development research indicates that 80% of all economic development in a small rural community occurs from expansion and retention which means that you grow small and micro businesses and you help the existing businesses uh, grow. Uh, we, there is no magic bullet to economic development. The answer is a very focused, sustained uh, commitment to an economic uh, development program. And uh, it, it's, it's very, the, the other 20 percent, you know, the we, we talk about, you know, Facebook coming into Los Alamos. Those are site selectors. And before the city of Bloomfield ever hears from a site selector, they've already been here, they've done their research, and they're coming here for a specific reason. Uh, Cynthia and Sue and I have sat down. We, we have crafted a 50-point economic development plan. It, it will grow. There is no magic bullet but you have to be committed to a very sustained, focused program. Uh, it does include, uh, you know, working with Tim Cummins, as Scott said, on the industrial park. We are really the only city in the county that has an industrial park. Uh, and it does include a beautification program. Uh, but it, it includes many others, and, and primarily, 
Uh, it's a focus on growing and sustaining small and micro businesses. Thank you very much. Sue Finch, please. Thank you so much. Um, you know, I really appreciated Ken and his input because this is something I wasn't particularly educated about. And so with him enlightening me, I've come up with the thought that we need to be able to think out of the box for this economic development. We need to see where there's opportunities where we can bring that. Um, I like the thought of working with Tim Cummings and in, in increasing the availability of businesses in that industrial park. We have a lot of properties going towards Aztec that have biz oil and gas businesses that have been left that maybe we need to uh, encourage the Hill Corp and the other businesses to make this a station that they could uh, do service on their vehicles and, the, and their men that are working for them won't have to drive all the way to Farmington for those needs that they have. Um, I noticed on Facebook this week that San Juan Regional was offering uh, a workshop that that we could come because they were wanted our input for economic development in our rural communities. I think that's a very important thing. I think we might need to address maybe a assisted living, another assisted living unit for uh, area for this area. So that would be something that could be sorted, uh, absorbed here. Um, I think we need to think out of the box. Thank you very much. Thank you. Cecilia Ganell, same question, please. Economic development. So in talking with a lot of people in town, the first thing they always say is, we need a Walmart, we need a Safeway, we need a Walgreens. In reality, we don't have the population for that. The economy slope, it's, Walmart is not, not going to fix our problems. So our community has to. Uh, same thing Ken stated. It is proven fact that um, clustering, Builds, you know, builds builds economy. So uh, maybe we should encourage those uh, vacant property owners. Like, I mean, we're not going to get rich off a of tax, but we could um, we could do a uh, land value tax on those vacant properties and encourage them to fill those spots, um, or even you know maybe help help mentor new companies coming in or new little entrepreneurs coming in, uh, mentor them through that process. I mean, maybe there's 15, 20 people in town that have a great idea, but just don't know how to start, you know, build, build a committee, the ro you know, roadside, Sonia's, those type of businesses that have held strong Mr. Cummings, um, and help them, get them to help others. Um, and like I said, if, if that doesn't work, then hit them where it hurts tax them and get them to fill those buildings. Thank you very much. Cynthia Tensio, please. Well, like Ken said, I've, got, I've had the great, I say honor, of working with him because he knows about economic development. And I think as a city leader, if when elected, and even if, you know, the ones that we have now, the best thing to do is look for our resources that we have in people like Ken and other people that know that kind of stuff for the big businesses. I did get, I hope when I, um, I talked to one of our business owners and I thought he had the best idea. He said, Cynthia, you know what? We're a small town and we need to get back to small town. And on that part of it, like I know about small town and on that part, what Ken said about nurturing our current businesses and helping them to expand and retain them and get more business for them, that helps our grocery seeds grow. Where I would, so I, I know about the hometown part, and I totally agree with that. If we can get back to focusing on who we have and what we can keep, and then work with people like Ken that know about economic development to help get those other bigger businesses that know how to do with Tim Cummins and stuff, all of that. But what, if we can, for sure, my part would be to nurture those companies that we have, work with those business owners that are our friends and our family, and work together to grow this economy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Penny Kling, your answer to that question, please. Economic development. Well, I'm not going to be real critical with the, uh, with the mayor. Eckstein has worked hard. Uh, I worked with uh, him and uh, David Fugue a short period of time. 
on a project, and uh, I know they are working diligently to bring in um, some small businesses. Mm -hmm. Any small community, you go through these cycles and they're dependent upon one company or a gas-based uh, company, and you're going to have people come and go, businesses uh, come and go all the time. When you look at the downtown Aztec, I mean, it's musical chairs, the businesses that just keep popping up and failing and going. So the type of businesses uh, Scott's been trying to bring in are for long term, and they're not giant businesses, but they are good businesses that would help sustain the community and improve our gross receipts tax. I'm aware of small communities, and it's hard, really hard. One thing is focusing, finding the right target and focusing on it and just hound the hell out of them until they give in and come here. That's about all I can say. Thank you very much. Delaz Lindsay, please, you're next. Uh, yeah, you know, I thank you, uh, Benny. That, that just, uh, to me, makes sense. Um, you know, and, and I love small business. I think every, I think there's that, uh, I, I love to to go different places and see the little small shops, but I always wonder how they make it. Uh, because when I see some of the ones over at Aztec, it's like they're here today and they're gone tomorrow and, and they're just, you know, uh, and the people that own them, they're devastated when they fail. Uh, I've started, tried to start businesses myself and failed. And it, it is, it's hard to recover. Um, uh, uh, with some of the, even even as as uh, two years ago, before the economy started to crash, I mean that uh, our our park out here, our business park, we had three other businesses breaking ground. They were ready to break ground. They were, I, you know, they were already signing the papers, but when the economy went, they they backed out. And, and so you can't blame them for that. We are continuing to press forward on those things. Um, we do need businesses that, that are long term, that are gonna, that are gonna be here, and, and that we can rely upon as a city. Um, uh, and, and yes, because when we have those bigger, bigger uh, businesses to, to sustain us, then we can work with the small businesses and encourage those things. And so I think it's a group effort. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Our next question is posed to the mayoral candidates. So council candidates, you can, I'm sorry, did I? I think you may have missed Councilor Rourke. Mr. Rourke, did I miss? On that answer, I think. I think Ms. Rourke started. <laughs> did, right? Did he miss you? No, you took it first, I think. We're good, right? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, uh, council candidates, you take a little bit of a break. We're going to ask this of the mayoral candidates, please. And Mr. Kling, I'm going to ask you to start for us. So, the question is um, from the audience, what is your understanding of how the mayor can influence the council? Oh. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> a mayor is going to be a oh, leader. Microphone, please. Oh, I'm sorry. You know, I'm not going to be real critical of Scott. He's, he's worked hard. However, a mayor is a leader, he's a guider, he's a facilitator. Uh, having good ideas come from the people in the community and the mayor should be there to be the one to support their ideas and talk them out. I, think, I don't feel that the, there's been a lot of uh, transparency in my opinion. I know a lot of things that's happened behind the scenes. And uh, I think we need more transparency. Scott started the bits and pieces. Uh, I've seen a lot of things left out that was important things. If it means we need to add another page, then do it. But the community needs to be informed. Uh, the best thing I can say is I want to be a leader. I may be older. I've got a lot of a lot of tracks behind me, and uh, I've worked uh, 
part of the oil and gas industry. I was a, a uh, corporate uh, safety officer, and uh, I know how it, what it takes. I dealt with a lot of people, but uh, most importantly, we got to represent the community and uh, make good decisions because there's been a whole lot of bad ones. Thank you. Thank you very much. Scott Eckstein, same question to you. How can the mayor uh, influence the city council? Okay, real quick, I'd like to uh, touch on what uh, Mr. Kling said about transparency. Yes, that was one of the reasons I ran in the first place, because I thought government lacked transparency. And that was one of the uh, goals that I set was um, keep citizens informed on how their money is managed, keep citizens informed. Do we do a great job of it? We do better than we did. Do we do a perfect job? No, we've still got room to, to improve. But nothing is secret. We try to be as transparent as possible, but it's really difficult to get the citizens all the information that they, that they desire. Come and talk to us. That's the best way to get the answers, rather than rumoring out in the community and saying things that may not be true. But aside from that, being mayor, how do I draw the respect from the council? By choosing my battles. There have been times the council has voted opposite of the way I'd have them vote, but I support that decision because that's what they were elected to do. If I fought them on every time I disagreed with them, I would be the most ineffective mayor there is. I think by working hard, since I'm retired, working and showing the council that I truly care about the city, truly care about the future of our city, and I'm working hard to make a difference, they respect that. I truly believe I have the respect of all the council, uh, city manager, and the administration, and that's because I choose my battles. I support the council even unless it's something ethically wrong, which I've never seen them do. But if, if, it's, if it's not unethical, it's legal, and that's the decision they make, I think it's my job as the spokesman for the community to support that decision and not criticize that decision. And in return, I get the respect from them, and we can move forward as a team. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Cynthia Tensia, other mayoral candidate, please. I do believe, as well as what Mr. Kling and Scott said, that, um, or Mr. Eckstein, I guess, if I say both of them, Mr. Huh? Um, that mayor is a leader, and I think you lead by example, and um, I think, you know, it, when you have a good council, too, they also lead by example. And I think as a mayor, you're there as a voice for the people, but also as council members, you're there as voices for the people. So what I would encourage is for all of us, you, whether elected or not, or even, you know, if not elected, to talk to your council, talk to your mayors, voice your opinion, like they've said, and make sure and be heard. So, and as a leader, the, the mayor doesn't get a vote unless there's a tie. But you do have the influence, and I think as long as you stay with good moral values and integrity and bring those issues to the council, they will, they will look to you as a leader. Thank you very much. Thank you, mayoral candidates. Now we'll go back to all of you, and uh, this question again from the audience, and Mr. Uh, Lindsay, we'll start with you this time. And the question is, uh, the city of Bloomfield only has one park with play equipment. It's old and scary to go to because it's known that you'll get asked for money, harassment, or drugs. How would you correct this issue or these issues? Well, I believe when we have the opportunity to, uh, to uh, bring the the, the money that we will uh, accumulate from our electric, that we can begin to put some of that into our parks and, and even as we grow the economy and, and things like this, there's just a lot of, of areas out there that I believe that we can draw from uh, as the economy uh, begins mm -hmm. to grow. All right, thank you very much. Mr. Kemp, same question. Uh, yeah, I, on the same subject of, of the parks and stuff, um, yeah, there's a lot of things that could be done to the parks, like the one down on the river there. Um, uh, it shouldn't have been, they, they got a lot of rotten poles down there that they put in and put the cables up. Well, it's all rotted down, so I think there's other ways, you know, that we could fix that and problems. We could probably get some pipe from, from different people, you know. There's a lot of people wanting to donate stuff to different cities. And uh, maybe ask for volunteers to replace some of this and clean up some of that. Because uh, it's pretty bad down there in the park. I ride my bicycle down there about 
three or four times a week. And uh, it's pretty iffy what goes on down there at that park. So it needs a lot of attention. And uh, thanks. Thank you very much. Mr. Rourke. Yes, we, we can, uh, we can uh, uh, pay closer attention to our parks and everything. And, and as far as uh, people being informed, uh, uh, I don't have a problem with that at all. I think uh, we can do a better job, but the people can do a better job as well. You know, you, uh, at every council meeting, the second and fourth Mondays of every month, uh, when, when uh, uh, there's always a time at the end of the meeting where everybody can put in their input. And, and you can always be informed when you attend those meetings and listen to what's going on. Uh, <clears throat> and as far as the parks uh, and everything too, and even the weeds, I guess, there on the uh, uh, mediums and the curbs uh, that somebody has complained about, I think each and every one of us need to do a little better part. And I'm talking about group, uh, church groups, uh, Boy Scouts, uh, Girl Scouts, uh, whoever. Uh, I don't think it's government's responsibility to do everything. I think each and every one of us do need to do a better job as citizens in organizing these groups and do some of these things. Uh, and I would uh, challenge each and every one of us to uh, set forth and try to do that. Thank you and very much. And as a city, we, you know, we would furnish like safety vests or anything like that uh, where Nobody get run over out there on the medians or the curbs. Thank you. I beg your pardon for interrupting. Thank you very much. Next, Mr. Eckstein, your answer to that question on condition of parks. Maybe I'm cheating a little bit because um, as mayor, I interact with the department heads. And I, I, I actually spoke with Melinda Gomez, the uh, parks director here a month or so ago. And she does have plans to put equipment down at the South First Street Park. That's a park we've been working on. We planted grass down there in the last, well, 2013, I believe we planted grass down there. And then the river walk was put in. So we're trying to vitalize it. I agree, it's sketchy. I don't know how to, how to take that fear unless people just start using that park and there's just not people maybe hiding around the corners, breaking stuff and vandalizing. But we've got a police department that, that's active on that. But, um, you know, in this tough economy, Parks is considered a quality of life issue. We're needing to keep our police officers, we're needing to keep our fire department staffed. We'd, I'd like to add staff to the fire department. I'm not against that. It's just you can't, as Councilor Rourke said, you can't pay $100 when you've only got 20. So you, we've got to make ends meet. And parks, unfortunately, is oftentimes considered a quality of life and not a necessity. Um, I can tell you this summer, uh, I got complaints from a lot of citizens about the weeds and the medians. Parks was unable to keep up with the weeds and the medians because of the cuts that we had to make. Um, I found out the weeds all disappeared. I had sent the city manager numerous emails um, that I had gotten from citizens complaining about the weeds taking over the medians. The weeds disappeared. And I thought, well, he got parks down there. No, I found out city manager was down there at 7.30 in the morning, every morning pulling the weeds. And I'd have been there, but I had I was, had some other stuff going on where I wasn't able to help him. But I'd have been down there helping, and, and as Councilor Rourke said, sometimes we as a community, I think we need to pull together rather than complain and, and try to help out where we can. Um, it, it's amazing what we could do if we all just volunteer just a little bit to help the community. And I, I think that I thank each one of these people that are up here because this is really a volunteer position. If you think making seven thousand five hundred dollars a year as mayor or five thousand as a counselor is a money maker, you're sadly mistaken. So thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Ken Hare, same question to you, please, on uh, condition of parks and your thoughts. Uh, Yes, so what I, what I would propose is uh, an increased neighborhood watch program. It's, it's indisputable. The, the, the citizens have to step up and, and with, with good leadership, you know, we'll do that. With, with the weeds and so forth like that, again, if we don't have the city staff, then we've got to organize the, the citizens, the Chamber of Commerce. We have to do an adopt a medium program. Uh, and uh, maybe that flows over into our parks as well. I would suspect 
that in the park that we're talking about with, with a very effective neighborhood watch program, we, we would soon learn that there are certain times of the day that we probably need to, to allocate uh, you know our our police force, uh, but I think the key is a neighborhood watch program. And as far as facilities, what what the city desperately needs is a very experienced grant writer. And while we don't have that in the budget right now, we probably need to look at some volunteer grant writers, which we do know, and or contract with grant writers for specific uh, uh, you know projects. Uh, but beautification of the city is a critical economic development project. And one of my business partners is a large developer from Austin, Texas, and I keep bringing him here. He said, show me a project that I can make some money. I keep bringing him here. And the first year we did our beautification, the, the median with the pots, and he thought that was great. When he came last summer, uh, you know, unfortunately, he wanted to know, well, what the hell happened to your, to your median program? And, and that's where I think we've got to step up and we've got to adopt those things and we've got to take care of them. Thank you, sir, very much. Thank you. <laughs> Sue Finch, please. Thank you, sir. Um, you know, I've thought about this a lot um, because I think the parks are an area where families can go and they can enjoy their self. Children can, should feel safe. Uh, I don't, I know that our monies are not available because of the monies that we have spent on lawsuits, and it's cut the total morale of the city employees that are there. But I also think that we can look outside the box again. We can go to the Boy Scouts of America and visit with them that are in the local areas. I think the Methodist Church has a, a group, and so does the LDS Church have one and maybe work with them to see if they would like to do service projects. I know that the youth are willing to do service projects. We might even go into our high school, talk to them and address the issue there. Uh, I think it's a family thing that we could work if we had those outlets that maybe a family could to go in and, and work to improve that. To improve the playground equipment, it's very expensive. I think we might also be able to go to maybe um, these big businesses that have taken over Conoco and ask them if they would like to have monies. Um, maybe the coal mine, uh, I can't remember the name, it just left my mind, and ask them if they would be willing to donate some money to improve those uh, toys that the children play with at the park. Thank you. Thank you very much. Cecilia Gunnell, please. So I agree, we do need to, um, let me back up a little bit. So being a mom, I'm maybe the only one up here still with small children, um, part of, of keeping residents um, is going to be, what can my kids do? Because I know that probably 90% of my funds go to my children, anything they want, you know that that's where my money goes so while we don't offer any any places for children to have activities to bring in revenue we're going to have to focus on the parks so we're going to have to focus on um maintaining that equipment and and you may be able to address speaking because it's been brought up a, a few times i personally work at that large oil and gas industry that became a small oil and gas industry. And I can tell you now, because that's actually part of what I do, everybody's tightening down, everybody's buckling down. You're not going to receive as many donations as was possible before. We just, we also have to cut as well. So um, you, we cannot just rely on that. We are going to have to rely on citizens getting together. But you're going to have to, that's where the mayor and the council come in. There are a lot of groups, Boy Scouts and what have you. Um, my children, when they've been bad that weekend, they can also go help you. You're going to have to reach out, though. That's where you lead. You're going to have to say, I need 
I need, you know, X amount of people for this weekend. We have this project. Call it out to the community. I mean, you said you have the Facebook program, the bits and pieces. Use that to call on people to help because a lot of times they just don't know. That's Thank you very much. Up next, Cynthia Atencio, please. Well, I have to tell you, I love these ideas of grants and the citizens helping for to renovate the parks. I think the equipment has to be up to date. But I do have to say that the number one complaint that I've gotten from citizens and business owners so far is crime, that our crime is going up. And I think that's something that's going to need to be addressed to work with the city manager and the chief of police. Um, I know they're shorthanded, but we got to do what we can with the resources that we have. And um, I know it can be done. I know that if we get the police involved with our neighborhood watch programs, um, that's very instrumental because the neighborhood watch, you know, it, it needs that law enforcement backup to work right. Our citizens can be able to call in and tell them, you know, hey, there's people begging for money. And, but I think with, if we all work together, it's all about working together to get grants, to get the citizens together, to, up, to revitalize the park itself, to work with the police department, to start those neighborhood watch programs, to patrol more. Um, and it, it was just not, there is a lot of crime. We've had a lot of break-ins. We had the problems on North Frontier. Um, some of our citizens down by the baseball field like, feel like that they're not important because they're on that side of the highway. I don't feel like that. I feel like all of you are my neighbors. All of you are my friends. You're my family. And I want to be accountable to every one of you. Thank you. Thank you. And, and Mr. Kling, you'll wrap up this question for us. <coughs> Many years ago, I, uh, uh, when I started as a police officer, a city manager come out and rode with me one night. I'd passed probation. He says, you know, Benny, one thing you can tell about community's financial condition is the amount you see the street sweeper running up and down the street. I never thought much about it until I went on to different communities. And it was always an expensive thing. Uh, it's like owning a trencher. They just eat you alive. Well, the city last year looked to me as dingy as I'd seen it in a long, long time. The parks, we were down and we looked at it, the grass was brown, uh, there'd been some vandalism. Uh, I know friends uh, in my neighborhood, they won't go down and walk down there. Uh, they're afraid. It's going to take a community action and people to report suspicious activity or crimes that they see. As far as our parks maintenance, we're going to have to rely on community uh, organizations, I think, you know, for some time. But uh, if we're going to promote any economic development, when somebody comes here and they see the weeds as bad as they were last year, they're going to wonder why they'd ever want to locate here. One thing we can do is utilize our code enforcement people because the weeds that grow up on the sidewalks uh, is a property owner's responsibility and they should be addressed with that property owner or they go to court. Uh, once that's, they go to court a couple of times or people see it, they'll keep their weeds down. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next question, everybody. And uh, Mr. Kling, we'll start with you. And it involves some of the topics we've heard about earlier, which is water and sewer. What would be your solutions to the very serious problems of the water and wastewater issues facing the city of Bloomfield? Well, I'm familiar with the wastewater treatment plant. Uh, I reviewed their uh, discharge uh, levels uh, every month when I was uh, with the state environment department. Uh, that has been neglected for a long, long time. The city's known it, and no money's been put forth. Really, I mean, it, it's Band-Aid fixes. Uh, and then at the time uh, things go like this with the economy, it just got neglected. Uh, there are monies going to be available, uh, federal grant monies, to address some of these issues. Uh, the water plant's the same way. We went a whole year uh, with false reports, uh, it was 
an accident uh, and they got caught uh, on an inspection uh, we got to take care of these because we can't grow uh, very much or maintain ourselves now unless we have good drinking water and discharge the water properly I got the city I negotiated and I went behind the scenes with the environment department and got a grant and it was about eight hundred thousand dollars and then it went down a little bit and that was to put a retention pond in next to the sewer plant and we discharge uh, with the water into that rather than into the San Juan River and we'd subsidize it with Bloomfield irrigation water well uh, it, the project got water up to the pots and the trees uh, but not into that retention pond that retention pond would have bought about seven years but we, we there's no question it's got to be addressed thank you all right thank you very much Delaz Lindsay please your answer to the solution or fixing the water wastewater problems uh, yes I you know I, I agree with uh, uh, Benny here you know it, it's both the water and the sewer are are things that have been inherited uh, they've been long time problems um, uh, way before my time I just uh, uh, I just simply agree that they that uh, even our meeting last night, any of you that was there, that was uh, uh, our main agenda was uh, beginning to address the, the sewer plant. And so we're taking the steps right now to move forward on some of those things. And, and uh, uh, there are grants out there available. There are loans out there available that we're looking be going to begin to look into and, and uh, uh, address these problems concerning the water and the sewer both so thank you thank you very much Richard Kemp same question yeah uh, I agree with everybody that talks about you know we need to do something with the water yes, and the sewer and uh, and there might be money out there uh, but uh, we, we need to we should have been working on that a long time ago it seems like uh, you know, after the horses already got out of the barn, it's a little bit late to close the gate. But uh, now I don't. Um, that's about all we can do is keep working on that, and uh, like I say, drop some of the lawsuits and let's get on with <coughs> the subject at hand. And uh, I believe it's the uh, the water is our main objective, and back to cleaning up the yards and stuff is uh, that used to be. Uh, mandatory that you keep a yard clean and in front of your house too it used to they used to find you on your water bill well I don't see that anymore uh, I don't know how they, they take care of that but uh, I took care of mine with just a lot of rock so because <laughs> uh, I can't afford the water anymore anyway uh, that's all I got to say thanks thank you mr. Rourke same question, please. Well, uh, to address some other stuff ahead of time, uh, 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 prior uh, uh, comments, you know, we do need to focus on our parks a little bit more and, and get uh, kids out there. I, I know right next door to me, the AT&T Park, they're in there all the time playing baseball, football, throwing frisbees. They're having a ball. If we can get them out, in front, uh, out away from their iPhones and the computers, I, I think that's a good way. As far as the uh, water plant and the uh, sewer plant, number one, the water plant was totally redone here a few years ago. We have some of the best quality water in San Juan County. The next thing, you know, is what we're trying to do, and I hope we can get the red tape cut so we can accelerate getting the sewer plant done. One thing that is uh, in this plan is to completely redo that, even the sludge tanks, everything. Uh, and in that, we're going to also, if you were at the meeting uh, last night, uh, we're going to do a reclamation plant right there with it so that we can take some of that water and put it onto the parks and irrigate uh, rather than use city waters. And that will 
relieve some of the pressure off of the demand of, of the water plant itself. Uh, I think this is a good way to go. It's good planning, and I would like to see it done tomorrow. Um, but it isn't going to happen tomorrow, but we're going to try to do our best to make it happen as soon as we can. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Eckstein. <clears throat> okay, I've heard some people say this should have been addressed a long time ago. I know it's been, it was addressed in, in about 2009. Myself and two city managers ago went to Washington, D.C., and we got some federal funding to do phase one of the wastewater treatment plant. Phase one is 10 years old, but it, it was done through federal, a bulk of it was through federal funding. Phase two, you know, when you're talking multiple millions of dollars, where are you going to come up with that? Well, the, the wastewater and water, paying for that doesn't come out of the general fund. It comes out of the utility fund, which is paid for every time you pay your water bill. What happens when the council wants to raise your water bill? We get a packed out council chamber saying, don't raise my water bill. And just this last time, the council refused to raise your water bill when it was suggested. So where are we, we going to get this money? We can't pull it from the general fund. We've got to come up with innovative ideas, as some of the others have talked about, getting grants and getting federal funding. Unfortunately, the federal funding, they used to give capital funding that paid for phase one. The federal government's hurting, too. They're not giving out money like they used to. So we've got to come up with creative ways. Last night, we learned that it's going to cost about $11 million. So that's a real challenge. And on top of that, within the next Three years, Bloomfield Irrigation District thinks that we're getting a cheap rate on the water that we're buying from them. They want to raise your rates by up to 700%. Where's that going to ultimately end up? It's going to end up in your bill. I have fought that, and I have fought that, and I have fought that. But in 2020, the contract comes up for renewal. And uh, we're going to have some tough arguing with Bloomfield Irrigation Ditch because I don't want my water bill to go up any more than you want your water bill to go up. But there's a lot of challenges right now. Thank you very much. Ken Hare, same question, please. You know, we were, we were talking a few minutes ago about critical positions like the EMS. Clearly, we're looking at millions of dollars over the near term here. And I think it's very apparent that uh, grant writing is both an art and a science. It's, it's not something that we can afford to, you know, learn on the cheap. Uh, so I think a, a really good grant writer, grant writing firm is becoming one of those very critical positions because money is available for many of these projects and, and we're running out of time to go after that money. Uh, clearly we've, you know, our legislators have got to be our very best friends. We, we can't afford to alienate them. Uh, in terms of the water, I, I will take issue uh, with Scott the Bloomfield Irrigation District and the Citizens Ditch is our main source of water. It will always be our main source of water. And we have reached a point that we have got to sit down with, with the Citizens Ditch and <clears throat> do two things. We, that's our, going to be our major source of water. And we have got to sit down and, and negotiate an agreement with them. Look, they're in the same position that we are. They're broke. And, uh, you know, we're, this is be, it's going to be a critical partnership with the Bloomfield Citizens Ditch that we're going to have to establish and sit down and, and do some tough uh, negotiating. We, we cannot do without that ditch. And they don't have the, the, the funds to maintain it. So we're going to have to form a partnership for maintenance. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sue Finch, same question, please. Thank you. I was at the meeting last night, and I was very impressed with, I think it was Jason's, you know, explaining what needed to be done. And when he said the cost of the project was going to be $11 million plus, I remember seeing Curtis Linton said, you know, where are we going to get the money? And I thought back on that. I thought, we have got to come up with some creative ways to do the money. I agree with Ken Hare that we uh, would be a, nece a necessity to have a grant writer, even if it's contract, because these monies uh, will have to come available for it. We have an administrator administration order that we have to have this fixed. So, the state's looking at us also. 
Um, there was four or five options there that we could do. One of the last options, he said that President Bush had signed some documentation yesterday allowing so many. President I mean, Bush. Bush. I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Trump. <laughs> no I, I did that earlier. <laughs> hey, didn't I? Uh, Trump had, had uh, signed some le uh, legislation that monies would be available for the state, especially for rural areas. I think we need to jump on it and see what's available. Uh, anything else that she talked about with the grants and the other things that a lot of them, we'd have, they'd only pay a certain percentage and we'd have to come up with the other monies. Bloomfield has to think about where these other monies are coming from and not to spend money unnecessarily. Thank you. Thank you very much. Cecilia Gunnell, please. Nope. Mine's going to be short and sweet because I echo everybody, everybody up here. I might have a tiny controversial thing to add. I feel, and I do not know the gentleman, I feel a lot of inadequate decisions were made in the city engineering portion of our city. Um, so I think we really need to take a hard look at either um, second opinions, uh, extra studies, uh, getting ahead of these problems beforehand, because I too believe that this was a, a long-term issue um, that we just kept slapping band-aids on that could have been dealt with earlier on. And I do believe that solely belongs to the city engineer. Thank you very much. Cynthia Tencio, we'll wrap up with you for this question. I completely agree with looking for grants because we do need that wastewater. I love the idea that we're going to be reusing the water, the reclaimed water, to irrigate the medians, the parks, whatever we can with that. I know we're going to have to look for grant money. I'm not sure where all the money is going to come from. I also agree with Ken Hare, we have to work with the BID. We have to, and I don't think that that's a relationship that cannot be repaired, but I think, I don't know so much that they wanted to do the 700%. I think they wanted us to come to the table and talk to them, and I think we need to do that, because that is our first source, and we need to repair that relationship, because without, again, like I've said over and over, without water and wastewater, the rest doesn't mean a whole lot. So we need to work on repairing our relationship. We need to work on finding grants to fund what we can. I know they can't fund everything. I know they've cut back. But um, the presentation last night at the city council meeting was wonderful um, from CH2M, I believe it was. And those ladies had a lot of great ideas. I don't know if they do grant writing. But if they do, they sure sound like they know what they're talking about. And that's, again, I. I commend the city for using people that know what they're talking about. Um, and that's what we need to continue to do, work on our relationships, find the money, find people that can help us find the money. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, candidates, it is now time for all of you to ask your opponent a question, if you would like. It's an optional uh, thing, but we would like to give you that opportunity. And uh, Cynthia Tensia, I'd like to start with you. If you have one of your fellow candidates for mayor you'd like to ask a question of, just one, uh, who would it be and what's your question? I would like to ask the incumbent mayor because he probably knows the answer. Um, my question is, where exactly is the money coming from to pay these legal fees for the electric utility? Out of the utility fund. The current water utility? That's the only utility we have is, is water and wastewater. So yes, that's where... That's where the legal fees are coming from. Since 2011, the total legal fees have been 300, and I've got the number here, somewhere just over 300,000. So uh, that's, that's where the fees are coming from, is, is from the utility, uh, water utility. If I'm not mistaken, Eric, is, I'm correct on that, yeah. Thank you both very, very much. Next, uh, Mr. Kling, we'll go to you. If you have a question for one of your mayoral opponents, who would you like to ask, and what's your question? Scott. Golly. <laughs> <laughs> That's all that pay. <laughs> I'm getting my 7,500 tonight. <laughs> and please use a microphone so we can all hear you. Okay. Uh, in the past, the, uh, the city's kind of suffered some embarrassment over the second source of water. Uh, I know the... the uh, 
I want to choose my words correctly. I don't want to embarrass anybody, but uh, the then city manager kind of led the council down a primrose path. And it, it's cost us a massive amount of money. And I know we're still recovering from it. I think Mr. Fugue did a, a good job trying to bring us out of it. Uh, but Scott, what do you think would be the best improvement uh, in the communications and overseeing of the city's manager? I'm not sure. I thought you were well, asking a question about the second source. Now well, it's the second source. These, these, all these things that come about during that time and the decisions that were made, uh, the monies that were spent, and even the mayor and council weren't aware of it with that city manager. Well, we, we, what would you do now? What do well, we, we hold the city manager accountable. Um, if I wanted the city manager fired, I can't fire the city manager. It's my role as mayor to appoint the city manager, but I've got to have the consent of at least two council members. I can't fire the city manager without the consent of two council members. So what, what it is is working together with the council. If we see an issue, we address it. I think that's only fair to address it with the city manager. Um, as far as the second source, you say massive amounts. The bulk of that $2 million came from state capital funding. Yes. It appears it was waste of money. We still use the second source on occasion. They said it was it was needed for emergencies, um, but you know you never can predict an emergency when when the waters. I don't know if everybody's familiar with the second source, but water comes out of uh, Largo Wash and it makes the second source unusable. And yes, it does look like it was a waste of money. But the silver lining there is, and, and I'd like to go back with what Ken Hare said, I don't think we should be totally reliant on the citizen's ditch. I think we need to diversify our por portfolio of water. That's why we're connected with Aztec, so we can get water from Aztec if we need. I think we need to get that second source working. We have a plan. It's called the Rainy System. What the Rainy System is, is we put a well underground, under the river, and there's that naturally filtered water that runs under the river, a river itself, and that's naturally purified water. We can draw from that and make the second source not a total waste of money, and we can also add to our portfolio of water. We're, we're talking about tying in with um, Lee Acres and, and other water systems so that we're not totally reliant and being held hostage by any one water supplier. I don't think that's good for any community. They've got to be diverse. So I hope I've answered your question. Um, no, you're right. You're okay, right. thank you. Yeah, thank I, you. I, that second source water system was, I wanted to bring that up specifically because we need to address it. Yep. And it's, it is being addressed. We've been working on it with last city manager Fuquay and currently with uh, city manager Straw. We, we're, we don't want that to be wasted money. We want to do everything we can to save that project. Thank you both very much. Uh, Mr. Eckstein, stand by. I'll get back to you in a minute, all right, for your okay. turn. But let me move on uh, in our order here to uh, Delaz Lindsay. Do you have a question for one of your city council opponents? I can't really think of one right now. <laughs> so, no, I guess I don't. All right. Mr. Kemp, same offer to you if you have a question for one of your city council opponents. Uh, Mr. Delaz, there. Uh would we, how would we get permits to, to get uh, water out of the, the San Juan River? I guess is my question. To Mr. Lindsay? Yeah. How do we as a city get permits to do that? I, I don't know. Oh, okay. Mr. Lindsay, would you just repeat your answer, which I think was he doesn't know? Is that correct? Correct. Okay. All right. Thank you. Let's move on to uh, Mr. Rourke. Do you have a question for one of your opponents? And who would it be? Mr. Kemp, I guess. Uh, in, uh, the, now he has expressed a uh, uh, desire that he's totally uh, against us acquiring the uh, electrical utility system. Um, I would like him to really specify uh, as to why he is opposing this. Okay, Mr. Kim. All right. Uh, number one is uh, where are you going to get the trained employees? Uh, you can't just, uh, you know, can't get them off the street. Uh, uh, you have to have qualified people. 
to do this work. Um, that's uh, number one, where are you going to get the equipment to? You have to have uh, up, upgraded equipment to work on stuff, power lines. Uh, does that answer some of your questions? Yes, uh, and if I may, I'll give, give some of my answers to that. Uh, uh, as far as qual uh, qualified people, we have some already qualified. Uh, we don't have anybody qualified on the city payroll of Bloomfield. However, we can contract with other people, other entities, to get that equipment and get those employees as well. Uh, <coughs> so it's the same as any city, especially those right now. We, we can see uh, cities that are hit with hurricanes real hard and everything, there is an abundance of people that come to the aid. And even, there are some of those out there that we can contract with. I hope that answers your question as to where these qualified people are going to come from. Thank you both very much. Uh, Mr. Eckstein, now your turn. Okay, I would like to address my question to uh, candidate uh, Cynthia Tensio. And my question is this, is there, is there, being retired and having been the mayor for the last 12 years, I spent a lot of time, a lot of time in the office during normal working hours, meeting with citizens, meeting with business owners, meeting with potential business owners, meeting with property owners, meeting with just other government entities and going over things. There's a lot of meetings involved. and. Most every time, unless it's a city council meeting, it's during normal business working hours. I understand you have a full-time job. How do you plan to accommodate the needs of the citizens and all those others that I've stated um, working during those times? I'm happy to address that. Um, we, before Scott, since he was retired, all the other mayors that we had had full-time jobs. Um, I think that gives some of what of an advantage because you are still a working class person. I plan to do just like I've been doing while I campaign. It, you, I don't have to have an office. Um, you can rent that office if you want to, but I will come to the people on Fridays, on the afternoons, in the evenings. I'll be glad to talk to anybody. If I have to call you back on my lunch hour, that's what I'll do. And I'm pretty sure a lot of you that are out here know me and have gotten to talk to me. And if I haven't gone to your house yet, I will. And I, that is how I feel about it. I feel that we've had other past mayors that have done a great job, and I feel like I can too. Thank you. Okay. Thank you both very much. Ken here, same offer to you. If you have a question you'd like to ask of one of your city council opponents, now is your chance. I'd address this. Microphone, please. Oh, sorry. sorry. Thank you. I would address this question to both uh, Elwin and DeLaws. I've had a you lot only of people. choose one, I'm sorry. Oh. So oh. just. Which, okay. which one would you want to hear their answer? Uh, Elwin. All right. Uh, Elwin, I've had a lot of people over the last couple of weeks come to me uh, with the concern that uh, the ACLU has given the city of Bloomfield a bill for their legal services over the Ten Commandment issues. And I would just like to know, is that true, how much it is? And is there a plan to address it if that is true? Mr. Rourke? Uh, that is true. Oh, microphone, please. I'm sorry. Maybe I was loud enough that you can hear me. Yes, uh, that is true. And the total bill is $700,000 on that. And right now we're looking at, uh, and there is a couple of companies that we haven't made any decisions, but we uh, are looking at a couple of companies um, and we're probably going to do it on the private side because the city really did nothing on that Ten Commandments monument. We never put a penny into it. It was 100 percent private citizens that done that, put it up. Um, and so we're going to try to keep it that way as collecting the money as well. Um, but there are a couple of companies that specialize in that. And this will be done through probably like FaceNet. And uh, there's something out there, and I don't really understand it, but it's called bots and it's tagged on to the Facebook entity to where, and it spreads on out to where you can also you can reach almost the entire nation and the monies will come back into that fund via PayPal and uh, we hope that we can 
uh, raise over the next three years 100% uh, of that money because that's when the bill is going to be due in three years. So, okay, yeah. So for clarification, though, at this point, legally, the city does owe the ACLU $700,000? Yes, that is yeah, correct. Okay. No, 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 that is not the ACLU itself. It's the attorneys. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sue Finch, same offer. If you have a question, you'd like to ask one of your opponents. I don't have any, but thank you. Okay. All right. Cecilia Gunnell, same offer to you. I do not have any, but thank you. Okay. All right. Very good. Thank you all very much. And this uh, will bring us to our closing statements, everybody. So um, how about another round of applause for all of our candidates for answering a variety of questions tonight? Appreciate it very much. I'm going to reverse the order that you drew this evening. And so what that means is, uh, Scott Eckstein, you're going to start, if you would, for the closing statements. You have Excellent. two minutes um, to start when you're ready. I think I have a lot to offer this last attempt uh, running at mayor. I think, I think we've accomplished a lot in the last 12 years. Uh, some of the things that we've accomplished in 2006, and I say we because I can't make any decision unless the council supports me. But some of the things we've accomplished is a new fresh water treatment plant, implemented the bits and pieces newsletter in the city water bill, new police and fire department buildings, which were voted on 80% by the citizens when times were good, uh, created an industrial park, uh, which brought in the first tenant, Wagner Cat. We did upgrades to the medians uh, to hopefully help with economic development. Um, myself and the Gateway City Civitan uh, Lisa Gomez had the idea to bring fireworks display to Bloomfield, which has been a tremendous success, paid for the bulk by donations that we actively go out and try to solicit so that we can bring something to, to our community for free. And as I said, it's been a tremendous success. The balance is paid for by the lodger's tax, and that's paid for by people that come and visit Bloomfield and stay in our hotels. I've created the, or was a founding member of the annual Mayor's Ball, which benefits this year and in the years to come, few years to come, are going to be the, the Boys and Girls Club, specifically here in Bloomfield, brought Fireball Run to Bloomfield, which was huge. Um, it, was, it was televised nationwide. It was, it was a race car thing in 2013. Um, and I think that was really great for the city of Bloomfield. We had a massive turnout. We successfully annexed 280 acres um, of land to include the gas plants, which is going to be huge. We did upgrades to the Verde del Rio San Juan, the River Walk Park, and actually installed the River Walk while I was mayor. And we're currently working on um, with property owners to bring in diversified uh, businesses here in Bloomfield. My biggest thing is I'm retired. I have the time to spend, and I'm telling you, I know Cynthia says that mayors of the past, but I think times have changed, and people expect the mayor to be there when they're, when they're there, and I will be there, and I have been there when people are there, and I also bring the experience and knowledge of the last 12 years, things I've learned. As I said, I don't make any decision. I can influence decisions to some degree through the respect that I've earned Thank you. Um, as mayor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ellen Rourke, your final statement, please, for two minutes. I would uh, ditto pretty much all of the uh, things that uh, Scott had mentioned. We have made a great deal of improvements, and yes, we do need to make more. We need to continue on the same path that we are. And I'd like to just kind of throw out an analogy to everybody. It was, it was something that uh, Mary Fisher, uh, councilwoman in the city of Farmington, made some years ago. Uh, and it was reference to Captain Scully. Captain Scully was the pilot of a uh, commercial airliner that took off from New York LaGuardia Airport. And not too long after uh, a takeoff, he encountered a, a, a flock of geese, which knocked out both engines. <clears throat> During that time, with his experience, 30 years plus experience and his training, it almost kicked in automatically that he was able to take that plane, make a 180 degree turn, landed in the Hudson River without, with just minor injuries. And that was because of training, keeping up with uh, training and his experience. And I would just ask that uh, the voters consider that, uh, the training and the experience that we have as the current council and the current mayor. 
And I hope that you would vote that way. Thank you very much. Richard Kim. Well, first of all, I'd just like to say thanks for everybody that came out. Uh, I thought there'd be more people, but uh, I'm glad that uh, what did come. Uh, I think we need to have more meetings and let, uh, let the folks out there know what's going on. Uh, there's a lot of people in this town that uh, they just don't know. Uh, so. And thank all the candidates for what they've said, and uh, thank you, folks. Thanks. Thank you. Delaz Lindsay, please. Well, you know, um, I feel like I've learned a lot in the last four years. Um, uh, I've, I've just been honored to work with uh, the council that we have, uh, with the mayor, with with our city manager, our, our department heads, I, I, they're just awesome. And, uh, you know, one thing I know that a divided council is real hard to get anything accomplished. Uh, and granted, we don't agree on everything. Um, but for the most part, the direction, the overall direction that we're taking the city, we do. And we honor each other in that. And we respect each other in that. And I'm just looking forward to another four years of that. So thank you. Thank you. Penny Kling, your final statement, please, for two minutes. Well, it was a long thought out decision to run for mayor. I know Scott puts in a lot of time. Being a mayor is about a 45 hour a week job right now because things are really tough. Um, you probably don't see a lot of my campaign signs out there. One reason is my wife and I decided to go paperless. <laughs> we, don't, uh, we didn't want to buy in. <laughs> the other thing is it forced Scott to buy campaign signs finally after 12 years because his other, others were looking pretty dingy. <laughs> Honestly, it is a full-time job and it's hard. Uh, particularly in these times. I think there is a good reason for term limits. A person reaches the point where they have done the most good they can do or the most damage. Uh, we're, we're faced with some very, very serious issues and almost survival. We're going to have to work very hard getting grants, addressing these projects, putting priorities on them. And one of the other reasons I didn't go out and buy campaign signs is we only had about 800 voters the last time. And uh, it's not a good investment. I think we can do better. We need to get more people involved and they need to come to the council meetings. That's all I have. And thank everybody for coming this evening. Thank you. <laughs> Cynthia Atencio, please. Okay, I'm gonna start off by saying for Mayor Eckstein and Benny Kling, I'm gonna take that as a challenge because if you tell me you think I can't, I'm gonna show you that I can and I will. <laughs> and, <laughs> and if it helps, I'm younger. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> But I want to reiterate um, that I, I love Bloomfield. I do. I mean, anybody that has talked to me knows, whether it's the schools, our school athletics, the Chamber of Commerce that I'm on. You know, I started the Pozzoli Cook-Off because nobody else did that. And I want it here in Bloomfield. My heart is here in Bloomfield. I might not have been born here, but I was born here in New Mexico. And I am here, and like I said, I'm a proud 1988 graduate of Bloomfield High School. And I want to be the voice for your community. I want to be your voice for this community. And I am not a career politician, and I don't plan to be. So I'd like to do what I can, get in, do what we can, work together, and move on. And I want to thank again the Bloomfield St Student Council and the Gateway Civitans for hosting this. I really appreciate it, and I love getting out and talking to you all. Thank you very much. <laughs> Cecilia Gunnell, please. 
So I don't really focus on on the uh, speaking to you about the exact details because only only uh, department heads and and things like that and people spent money on getting and copies and, and sharing and stuff like that I want to focus on what is interesting to me and that is the people um, I organize a lot of events I plan a lot of things I'm an active member of over 20 uh, or uh, volunteer for over 20 nonprofit organizations in San Juan County currently all at the same time. Um, I do a lot to gather a lot of people. And so I feel like that is a resource you need right now. And, and maybe I don't make the council, but I feel like I could lend a lot of that service to any one of these people that do. Because any f it doesn't matter what five people make that panel, they cannot do it alone. Those five people can never do it alone. They will, it will take the entire village, the entire community to fix what we are in right now. And so um, I just am here to lend my service in, in doing those things. And because I work in oil and gas, the things that I produce and create and programs I put forth, they are on a, are on a large scale and, and have large budgets. But I have had that largest employer budget and now we are down to the lowest employer budget and so i i am able to work with those things and i think that's a skill that the city needs is to rally the people so that's where i'm at thank you very much yeah. sue finch please thank you scott you know i i, I just totally amazed at the amount of people that are are seeking re-election and, and are concerned about the city of Bloomfield. Uh, it's probably one of the first times I've seen this amount of people uh, wanting to see if there could be a change and be able to support the city of Bloomfield and also have the needs to communicate with them. I truly would like to have town hall meetings that we could inform the citizens so that they would know what's happening in each department. I feel like we need to raise the morale of the city employees by giving their raises back. I feel like we can use avenues of grant writers to make it available so that we can improve the waste department. Uh, we have to be wise in our decisions. We have to use common sense. And do you know when I first decided to run, I remember getting my bits and pieces and I looked at it and I saw it and I thought, I should run for city council. And I just kind of put it away and I made a trip to Utah and I came back. <coughs> And then I felt the inspiration to do it again. So I thought, let me fast and pray about it. Let me talk to my husband and make sure he would be willing to support me also. Uh, we, all, we both agreed that this would be a decision that I could make a contribution to Bloomfield. I'm a greenie in politics. I uh, have been a stay-home mom. But I have a great desire to learn and to investigate and support the city of Bloomfield and support the citizens that live here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ken here. You're next. So the question that I pondered in a, in a closing statement is, what do you hope to accomplish if you're elected? Uh, clearly, I'd like to stabilize the finances of the city, seek new sources of revenue, develop a needs-based strategic plan, implement, implement a 50-point strategic economic development plan, to develop small and micro businesses, implement a metrics-based management by objective system, develop a grant system to secure infrastructure funding, prioritize infrastructure repairs and upgrade. Uh, one thing we haven't talked about, it, we, we're going to have to look at our cybersecurity protocol. Farmington got hacked. I mean, it's a matter of when, not if. Uh, we need to review and improve our bond rating, revitalize the planning and zoning process, bring resolution to the electrical purchase system, uh, resolve our water sources, both second and primary. Uh, I served as a uh, member and vice chairman and chairman of the San Juan College Board for 11 years. That's a pretty, pretty large, complex organization, but I learned a lot. And uh, I also served as president of San Juan Economic Development Services and was a founding uh, member of its successor, Four Corners Economic Development. And uh, so I, I think those experiences 
including being a very uh, successful businessman here in Bloomfield. And I, and I will tell you that being, uh, being in a small business, most of us has been on the edge several times, and you don't forget those lessons. And so I think with the skill set, I bring, I bring new ideas and uh, new experiences. So thank you very much. Thank you. Please join me again in thanking all of our candidates for being here tonight and running for office. Thank you all for coming. As was mentioned, it's a small but uh, passionate crowd here tonight. I hope you'll pass along to your friends and neighbors the importance of getting out to vote. I think we all can be agreement of that. Uh, early voting will begin uh, in just a couple of days, as a matter of fact, everybody. Tomorrow. There you go. Happy Valentine's Day. And so uh, vote for someone you love up here. <laughs> and of course, the election is on March the 6th. Thank you all for coming. I'm with KSJE. We're a listener-supported radio station at San Juan College. Everyone have a good night. <laughs>